Good evening. My name is Mohsen Malani. I'm the executive director of the Center for Strategic and Diplomatic Studies at the University of South Florida. On behalf of our center, I welcome all of you to part two of my conversation with Dr. John Sennett about the corona crisis. The first conversation was so well received that we decided to hold part two of the conversation. In fact, we attracted a much larger audience for that event than we used to for our regular on-campus events. Surprisingly, we also had a good number of viewers from other states as well as other countries. As I emphasized last month, the corona crisis has not and will not decrease our center's activities to educate our students about major national uh, security issues. The distinguished members of our advisory board, the Honorable Judge Raymond Gross, Mr. Sam Bell, Mr. Stephen Mitchell, Dr. Karen Holbrook, Dr. David Stamps, Mr. Barry Alpert, and Mr. Ted Wolfe have urged me to take our activities to national and international level. I am grateful to them, as well as to the top leadership of the University of South Florida and to the College of Arts and Sciences and to Dr. Kiki Krusen for their unwavering support. Following the sage advice of our advisory board, I am delighted to inform you that we will have four virtual conversations in the next four months. We will have a virtual conversation on U.S.-China relations. We will have another one on U.S. policies toward Iraq, Lebanon, and Syria. We will have a conversation on U.S.-Israel relationship, and we will have a conversation on U.S. and Iran relations. We will use our listserv to inform you of the exact dates of these four events in the next four months. If you are not on our listserv, I urge you to go to our chat icon on the left-hand side of your screen and send us your email address so that we can include you in our listserv. Before I introduce Dr. Tiki Kurusin, I would like to express my sincere appreciation for the generous contributions made to this program by the Honorable uh, Raymond Gross and by Mr. Barry Albert and Mr. G. Melamo, both of the Bel Air Private Wealth Management Group of Raymond James. If you are interested in making a contribution to our center, that would be very nice. Just write to me. It is now my pleasure to introduce Dr. Kiki Krusen, who will introduce our prominent and distinguished guest. Dr. Krusen is the interim vice president for USF World and lead USF's global engagement, which includes study abroad programs, international student and scholar services, into pathway program, international partnerships, the global discovery hub that supports research mobility, Peace Corps programs, international alumni outreach, and global development activities. As you can see, she really is a busy lady. She is the author of numerous publications, including Globalizing University Research that was published in 2017. In 2016, she received the inaugural Big Ideas Award from the Society for Research Administrators for creating a peer resource, web-based global research toolkit. She maintains an active, very active research portfolio. She is an alumni of India Fulbright Program for Senior International Education Administrators and is an active scholar, teacher, and mentor. She has led student groups to Panama, India, and Peru, and has received, that's perhaps the most important thing for a university professor, and she has twice received USF's Outstanding Teaching Award. A faculty member in the School of Interdisciplinary Global Studies, she is an advisor and mentor to students and has served in 
leadership role in a number of professional organizations. Before I introduce her again, please uh, be aware that because of the problem with the weather, we might have some difficulties, in which case just be patient, we try to get reconnected to you. Please join me to welcome P Professor Kiki Cruz. Thank you, Mohsen, for that most generous introduction. I'm pleased to be with you on behalf of USF World for part two of our conversation about the corona pandemic. Before I introduce our distinguished guests, let me say a few words about the Center for Strategic and Diplomatic Studies. Um, as Mohsen, Mohsen mentioned, the center is a vibrant place for conversation and dialogue. The center has organized 12 conferences and conversations on timely issues, such as tonight's event, with prominent figures from the diplomatic corps, government, academia, and the nonprofit and private sectors. Altogether, the center has brought to our campus more than 120 speakers, including 13 former ambassadors, two Pulitzer Prize winners. And as a result of these activities, the center serves a very important role on our campus especially important in these times as a venue for dialogue and discussion. As Mohsen mentioned, if you wish to learn more about the center, you can do so on the USF website. You can search for the Center for Strategic and Diplomatic Studies, CSDS, that's Sierra, Charlie, Sierra, Delta, Sierra, CSDS, and you'll find uh, lots of information about the center. And Mohsen has described to us a very exciting a uh, calendar of events coming up. And then again, should you wish to make a tax deductible donation, you can do that too. So thank you. Uh, from the beginning, the center has, a, uh, since its inception, the center has addressed the major national security threats that face our country. And tonight's program is no exception. As of today, more than 113,000 Americans have died from coronavirus, corona, uh, COVID-19. Two million people have been infected, and at least 44 million people have lost their jobs, with many more feeling job insecurity as a result of this pandemic. Simply put, we are in a very serious public health crisis, and I can think of no one more qualified to discuss the subject than our own USF Dr. John Sinnott. So let me take a moment, and for those of you who don't know, of the background of Dr. Sinnott, he is a treasure at USF. He's a physician, scientist, and chairman of internal medicine at the University of South Florida Morsani College of Medicine. He is also director of the Florida Infectious Disease Institute. He received his MD from the University of South Alabama, where he also completed an internal medicine residency and infectious disease fellowship. In 1992, he was appointed Director of Infectious Disease at USF and served as the Associate Dean of International Medicine for the Morsani College from 2006 to 2012. While Director of Infe Infectious Disease at USF, he started the USF Florida Infectious Disease Institute, which helped the state spearhead a biodefense education program and built a nationally recognized infectious disease fellowship. From 1983, he also served as the epidemiologist for Tampa General Hospital. In the past 20 years, Dr. Sinnott has had a front row seat regarding emerging infectious disease. In 2001, during the anthrax crisis in Florida, Dr. Sinnott was the senior advisor to our Surgeon General here in Florida and to Governor Jeb Bush. During the 2003 SARS outbreak, he was a consultant to the Tianjin Infectious Disease Hospital, including a five- and ten-year follow-up consultancy. In 2009, Dr. Sinnott advised the Florida Department of Health about the swine flu H1N1 pandemic that began in Mexico. From 2013 to 2019, he has been a consultant to Publix on influenza vaccination and has helped the company increase its reach to more than 300,000 flu vaccinations annually in the state of Florida. Dr. Sinnott has also been advising many of our Thai hospital partners on influenza control. Most recently, he was appointed as senior advisor to the Global Virus Network. Locally, 
During the ongoing COVID-19 crisis, he is advising the Florida Aquarium, Tampa Bay Lightning, the Tampa Bay Buccaneers, among other organizations on COVID-19 prevention and management. We could not be more pleased to have such a distinguished expert with whom we can converse this evening. As usual, Dr. Milani will be moderating the program. As you all know, Dr. Mosa Milani is an internationally recognized scholar of the Middle East and executive, direct, executive director of the Center for Strategic and Diplomatic Studies. It is my pleasure to be a part of this program tonight. We look forward to part two. And without further ado, I hand the program over to Dr. Milani. Milani. Thank you very much, Kiki, for your introduction. I appreciate that. Uh, Dr. John Sennett, welcome to part two of our conversation. I know you are a very busy man, you're in high demand, uh, but you've been kind enough, generous enough to agree to come and share your expertise and your insight with all of us. Thank you very much for uh, being here tonight. Uh, if you do not mind, I'd like to split up my questions into two parts. Uh, the first part, I'm going to focus specifically on uh, coronavirus, COVID-19. And in the second part, um, I will do my best to ask some questions about public health ramification of what has taken place in our country. So with that, let me ask you my first question. It is said that the job of science is to make things simple, but not simpler. As a matter of fact, that is what is attributed, this quote is attributed to uh, uh, Albert Einstein. With that in mind, I'm going to ask you a very simple but very important question, and that is, how exactly does coronavirus makes many of us sick and kills some of us? Would you explain the mechanism? Yes. Um, the coronavirus is an RNA virus that is carried by air and by droplets. We inhale it into the upper airway and the nasal passages. There it binds to a specific site on these cells. It has a long name, angiotensin converting enzyme 2, but everyone calls it the ACE, ACE receptor. Once it binds to that receptor, the virus literally explodes into the host cell because it's under osmotic pressure. And then the cell becomes infected, okay? From there, because it's a new virus, we don't recognize it and it spreads throughout the body. People think of it as a pulmonary disease but that's just the more obvious part of the illness. What it really does is it infects the lining of blood vessels. By infecting the lining of blood vessels, patients can then present with a stroke, a heart attack, an unusual rash, headaches, etc. I would tell you the only thing predictable about this virus is that it's unpredictable. After infection is established, it begins replicating. Then, for unclear reasons, uh, a few risk factors are involved, age, uh, obesity, and diabetes, predispose you to an accelerated immune response. And they call that a cytokine storm. And that just means that there's too many inflammatory molecules activated at the same time. So two parts. One is infection of blood vessels with strokes, heart attacks, etc. And the second one which often kills people, is this overwhelming inflammatory response. So our treatments are geared towards one, with remdesivir, 
slowing the replication of the virus. And then we use other agents to slow down the immune response. Uh, I'm pretty sure a lot of our uh, audience are interested in knowing the uh, early symptoms of this infection. And also, uh, I'm pretty sure a lot of people want to know uh, if, uh, even if you don't have the symptoms, can you still be a danger to people around you? And if so, what is the uh, mechanism for transmission of virus from one person to another? Sure. Uh, tell me the first question again. I got three questions there. What are the symptoms? What are the early symptoms? Uh, the early uh, symptoms are you ache all over, you have a low-grade fever, you just don't feel well, and that lasts about three to four days. Then you either have an immune response with a real crisis, or for unclear reasons, you don't have an immune response, and you go on to recover, albeit very gradually. So a dry cough, a fever, and aching all over, not dissimilar from the flu, but a far more serious disease. That would be the hallmark. Okay. And then the second part of the question is, what if you don't have any of these symptoms? Could you still have the virus? And if so, what is the way the virus is transmitted from one human being to another? You can certainly have the virus asymptomatically and pre-symptomatically. Pre-symptomatically is if I were infected for two days before I had symptoms, I could spread the virus. Then I would get the cough, fever, and aching all over. Asymptomatic is where you have the virus, but you don't feel sick. We have several interesting natural experiments on that. One was on the Diamond Princess cruise line, where 20% of the people got sick, 80% didn't. But almost all of them were positive for them. So they were easily capable of infecting other people, but they did not feel sick in any way. Any way. There was an Antarctic cruise um, that took place shortly after this out of Ushuaia in South America. You know, that's not Tokyo, so you don't hear as much about it. But there, uh, the vast majority of people were asymptomatic, and only a few people had the virus and became ill. The, the determinants of this might be related to the number of viruses you encounter, but also to how you're genetically programmed to fight disease. Uh, I'm pretty sure every person who's watching this program is interested uh, about your evaluation of the prospects for a vaccine. So when do you think is most likely that we can develop a vaccine, and why does it take so long uh, for the most developed country, the most advanced uh, country in the world, with the most advanced medical technology and the best doctors to develop a vaccine? Please tell us uh, the procedure and the complexities of developing a vaccine. Sure. Um, to develop a vaccine, uh, you have to have an antigen, something that stimulates a protein that stimulates the immune response. For that, most people are targeting the spike protein, which is like the needle that injects the virus content into the cell. And the idea is to have antibodies that block that spike protein. Now, the process of doing that is not easy. First, you have an antibody that binds the spike protein. 
That takes several months to figure out. Then after that, you have to give low doses to well people to make sure they don't have unusual side effects, okay? Uh, for instance, with dengue fever virus, it just made dengue fever much more fatal. Um, so can normal people take it and not have a side effect? The second step after that is to give it to a larger group of people who are at risk of being exposed. And since we can't deliberately expose people to this virus because of its very unpredictable nature, we have to use natural experiments like doctors in the ICU, nurses, patients around the virus all the time. And to find out if it truly protects, we, you have to determine a dose, how much to give. You have to make sure that dose is safe, okay? Then you have to see if the dose is truly protective. Most vaccines, and I'll use the example of influenza vaccine, are not 100% effective. For RNA viruses, they're usually about 70% effective because of the genetic mutations constantly going on. So we have something that's 70 to 80% effective We've now given it to a large group of people, none of whom get infected. We then put it into a stage four trial. We give it to a larger portion of the population, but we follow them very closely because side effects can often take months to develop. And also, the immunity might be short-lived. It may last six months. It may last 20 years. These are totally experimental in nature. So to do that, it takes time. It's not something we can say we will have by Thanksgiving or Christmas. That's not possible. So you do not think we are going to have a vaccine before the end of this year? I do not. On the positive side, though, uh, this has a unique RNA polymerase. It enables the virus to make copies of itself. And because it's unique to the virus and not to people, if you had a chemical that interfered with that, you would have a pill that was a preventive rather than the vaccine. And it would be analogous to malaria, where you take a pill a week or a pill a day it would have to be worked out. I actually think we'll have a pill before we have a vaccine. Um, Dr. Senate, Dr. Fauci uh, said a couple of days ago that uh, we are only at the beginning stage of understanding COVID-19. Uh, the way it works, the way it kills. And uh, I know you have had considerable experience dealing with different kind of viruses. And I know in one of my telephone conversations with you, you were talking about the long-term ramifications of getting infected with this deadly uh, virus. Would you please tell us some of the long-term health hazards that we have to deal with when we get in infected with the virus, even if we survive? Uh, now, this is John Sinnott speaking from my experience. This virus is very similar to SARS-CoV-1 that ravaged China about 17 years and four months ago. When I returned a year later, or at five years later, rather, to China to follow up on these patients, of the survivors... 15% were on chronic oxygen. 12% had to have a hip replacement for unclear reasons. 8% had neuromuscular weakness 
and were on walkers or scooters. And a few patients had cognitive defects where their IQs had obviously been affected. This is why I'm so afraid of this idea of let's everybody just get it and get herd immunity. Well, you may not get herd immunity. You might get a whole bunch of chronically ill people. This is an unknown virus. Um, a few weeks ago, I think two weeks ago to be precise, a controversial research by uh, Columbia University concluded that if the U.S. had ordered lockdown and social distancing two weeks prior than what it did, we could have saved 30,000 lives. Now, I'm not a scientist, so I can render a judgment about the kind of research they've done, their methodology, etc. But for you, I think it would be much easier to address this issue. Rather than addressing that specific uh, research, my question to you is, when you look back in the past five months, what are the two big mistakes we made as a country in dealing with this virus? And I'm not talking, I don't want to make this a political discussion. I want to make it a medical discussion, a public health discussion. I, I would go back further than that. I would go back um, in 2016, the Centers for Disease Control received $13.5 billion in funding. Last year, they received $5.5 billion. The experienced scientists left. Okay? Secondly, USAID had a PREDICT program. Its job was to identify viruses that could find their way into the population. They were specifically looking at coronaviruses, and they were disbanded for budgetary reasons. Finally, in November, the pandemic response team set up to deal with exactly this situation was also disbanded for lack of funding. So we have a bunch of very hardworking, very committed, but younger people at the CDC making very critical decisions. We have a Surgeon General with no experience with this type of virus. Um, people didn't know what to do. They're worried about the economy. If they had locked it down, the country down two weeks earlier, even one week earlier, probably would have saved 35,000 lives. So you think that study is a credible study? It's a very simple study. They simply took the graph and instead of going forward, just went backwards a week. Yeah. By the way, uh, Dr. Sennett, I know that they did a similar study in England, and they came out with the same conclusion, that if they would have started an effective uh, program of social distancing and lockdown, they would have saved, one week, they would have saved at least 20,000 lives. Yes, and social distancing is not a new concept. It was developed by Dr. Tom Tuttle, in uh, the state of in Seattle, Washington, for dealing with the great influenza of 1918. At that time, wearing masks was mandatory in the United States. And in Boston, they had an example of a man that refused to wear a mask, and the police shot him. You mean they so, actually killed the man? <laughs> they killed him. Um, so they took the masks much more seriously at that time. I have a hunch within the year we will be taking masks just as seriously. So it seems to me that, Dr. Senate, you are not very optimistic, as a lot of people are, that we are beginning to control or contain this virus. Are we? 
Well, when I look at the data, there have been about a total of 4,000 cases between Pinellas and Hillsborough. That's projected to double in six weeks. So we'll have 8,000 cases. And six weeks after that, we'll have 16,000 cases. So I am not optimistic given our current almost laissez-faire attitude. People think the pandemic is over, but I would tell you it's just beginning. That is not a very optimistic analysis, but uh, you're a scientist and you look at data and uh, you're devoid of any ideological uh, inclination, so you call it as you see it, and we appreciate that. Dr. Sennett, I know you are quite familiar with the way the Chinese government and Chinese society has dealt, specifically in the city of Wuhan, province of Wuhan, with this uh, deadly disease. How effective were they in containing this, and what did they do that we haven't done? Uh, well, it's a totalitarian government. Uh, <clears throat> they put a city of 12 and a half million people on total lockdown, and then they would deliver food to them, uh, water, etc. But you could not come out of your house uh, without a permit as you could say, walk your dog or something like that. Uh, it took about five weeks, but the last time I heard, there were eight cases in Wuhan. Now, they've since had another outbreak up in the north of China, but that is probably people coming from Russia, not from Wuhan. Let me uh, focus on something that might be a little bit uh, controversial, but I think it has to be addressed. Because of my uh, conversations with you and these two programs, I became really interested in reading about uh, Corona and focusing on the uh, public health aspect of it. Now, it is now well established, well established that coronavirus has killed many more African Americans than white Americans, many more poor Americans than uh, affluent Americans. And therefore, some public uh, health experts are talking about health justice. Uh, do you think, A, what I just said is accurate? If accurate, why is it that more African Americans and more poor people have died as a result of this virus? And number two, how can we really improve the public health uh, conditions in case there is a second or third wave of infection? Uh, first, you are accurate. It is a national disgrace. The medical school participated in a demonstration <clears throat> earlier this week. You mean called, USF? Yes, called White Coats Care About Black Lives. When we see poor people and African-American individuals, we encounter health disparities. For instance, you have the ability to access medical care in the so-called American medical system, which is hard to do. But when you're poor, it's much more difficult. So these people bear an unfair, a very unfair burden of chronic disease, of obesity, asthma, lack of vaccines, lack of primary care, uh, diabetes, etc., hy untreated hypertension, and this is a national disgrace. It needs to be fixed. And, and from a uh, uh, health point of view, why is it that more African-Americans uh, die? Why is it that more 
poor people die? Is it has it anything to do with their genes, <laughs> or is it really has to do with the socioeconomic conditions they're in? Uh, there is a role of low levels of vitamin D in African Americans, okay, and in Caucasians also. Um, Clearly, if you're low on vitamin D, you're not going to do well. You need sunlight to convert vitamin D to its active form. African Americans, because of the pigment in their skin, do not activate their vitamin D as well. Um, but then, when you and I go outside, we're slathered with sunscreen, so we don't convert it very well either. So vitamin D is an issue. The other issue to me seems to be the underlying diseases. So if you get somebody with heart disease and diabetes and COVID-19, they're going to have terrible problems. If you get a 24-year-old in good health, they can survive those problems. A Someone 45, 50 cannot. And, and in, in terms of uh, uh, in terms of public health, is there anything specific state of Florida or the U.S. as a country can do to prepare us for a possible second or third wave, or this is too much of a political issue and we are not going to address it? I would pray that it does not become a political issue. We are all in this together. If we cannot act together as a unified country, there will be an extraordinary amount of disease, uh, uh, long-lasting side effects, and of outright death. And I would give an example, uh, wearing of a mask has almost become a political statement. Although when I wear a mask, I wear it to protect you because it keeps the virus with me. The surgical masks don't protect you. as They protect you some from other people. But the main reason you wear a mask is to stop you from giving it to other people. I know I travel often to China and during flu season there, if you don't have a mask on, it's considered a social responsibility. People will yell at you. Uh, I have one more question, uh, but before I ask you that question, uh, I ask the audience, please go to your uh, uh, iChat and send your question so that uh, we can start the uh, question and answer session in a few minutes. Uh, I'm pretty sure a lot of people are gonna ask you this question, but uh, what about pets? Well, and risk factor. Uh, uh, I have two dogs, so I have to, to be concerned as well. <laughs> that's one of the most common questions I get asked. Uh, no one is quite sure what to do about pets. They're a very minor role in this. The first animals known to get sick from it in the U.S., were lions and tigers at the zoo in New York. So clearly cats can get the disease. They don't die from it. They're sick for about three or four days, they get better. It's unknown if they spread it to humans. Dogs have been given the disease artificially. It doesn't seem to make them especially sick and they get better. On the other hand, if you're isolated, there's nothing better for your mental health than a pet. So if I developed COVID and was in my room alone, my pet's coming along whether she wants to or not. <laughs> Great. Uh, let me, uh, I've received a number of questions. Uh, let me ask you the first questions from uh, a colleague. Uh, she's asking, what are your recommendations for grocery shopping? 
Does cooking things get rid of this deadly virus? Should we avoid fresh vegetables? So a three-part question, recommendation for grocery shopping, is cooking things will kill the virus and should we avoid fresh vegetables? One, don't avoid fresh vegetables. They're very good for you. For unclear reasons, the virus seems to be inactivated by some extent by fresh vegetables. So that's not an issue. Um, cooking clearly inactivates the virus. Uh, 137 degrees Fahrenheit for five seconds kills the virus. So for example, when I want to sterilize my N95 mask, I just leave it on the dash of my car in Florida. And I guarantee you it's sterile when I get back. So the temperature is very good at killing the virus. Um, now, in the grocery store, you want to avoid contact with other people. So if you go and there's a bunch of people, especially if they're not wearing masks, just come back later. You know, why risk your life over getting vegetables on time? What I do when I shop, and obviously everybody has to shop, is I go when there's not a lot of people, and when I get home, uh, I'll uh, wash all of my um, non-perishable goods, cans, things like that. Just rinse them off with water or maybe a little alcohol or Windex spray, and they'll be fine in the morning. Because the virus can live on cans up to four days. And if you notice, when in a store, people all the time look at something and put it back on the shelf. So I'm pretty meticulous about that. Uh, perishable fresh foods, the virus seems to bind to them and be inactivated. The question regarding, would you recommend going to restaurants and to bars? And if so, under what condition? If not, why not? Sure. A restaurant or a bar would be great if I was the only one there and I was outside. Uh, the more people you put in, the greater the risk. If you have to go to something like that, say a restaurant, you would want to eat outside on a table away from everywhere else um, because people take their masks off when they eat. Uh, and there have been a number of very serious outbreaks associated with restaurants uh, and bars likewise because people drink alcohol, lose their social inhibitions, and naturally get closer. Finally, I would add, do not go to the gym. The gym is a great place to get plenty of bad viruses. So even if you wear your mask, you still won't recommend going to yeah because um i actually made a visit to a gym the other day so i could say i'd actually been and seen what was going on uh nobody had a mask on everybody's breathing 44 times a minute <laughs> it looked like virus hell to me so i left all right uh, i have two questions uh regarding uh, the origin of uh, the virus. Where did it originate from? Ah, the million dollar question. Yes. So the scientists are, if you get five of them together at a table without social distancing, you'll have a fist fight. Okay. One scenario is that this is a bat virus that went through an animal, probably a pangolin, an Asian anteater, and then infected a person. That's scenario one. Scenario two is that the virus went from a bat to another animal, okay? And they're mutated like influenza does in pigs and infected people. The third hypothesis that appeals to me is that in 2010, 
they did a very interesting experiment with these coronaviruses. We call their RNA, not DNA. RNA is not made to be genetic material. It's not stable. They would infect one cell with two different viruses, and a third virus would come out. And that's what I wondered what happened, either in an intermediate host, like a pangolin, or in a human host, where it just combined with another virus, reassembled, and ended up to be a terrible scourge. An argument in favor of the human origin is the spike protein is so specific for that site, it makes you think it started with a human coronavirus. Uh, we have a uh, question from Sam Thomas, who is a student, and uh, he's asking, what is the risk of transmitting, getting COVID-19, if we are in a classroom, six feet apart, appropriately social distancing, and wearing a mask? I'm very concerned about coming back to USF in the fall. I, I would not be. If you're separated by six feet on all sides and wearing a mask, okay, you would have a very low risk. Compare it to all of the other places you are, Ace Hardware, uh, the food market, the 7-Eleven, the gas pump. You know, you go through, I was trying to keep track the other day of how many small exposures I might have had. And by 10 a.m., I was at 20. So I, I would feel safe in a classroom like that. Dr. Sennett, what is, if you feel comfortable about the classroom, please tell us under what condition we can be inside, uh, say, a classroom, a restaurant, an office, versus uh, being outside. Is it as dangerous to be outside as it is being inside a classroom or a restroom? It's it depends much, on whether you're wearing your mask. Uh, restrooms and communal showers are dangerous places, okay? We have bioaerosols generated in toilets when you flush the toilet, etc. I, If I were teaching a class... I would try to teach it outdoors or in a large auditorium with everyone really spread out. And the circulation of air is not, you don't yeah. get the, uh, the virus from uh, uh, the air you breathe uh, through air conditioning and other systems. You do. That is a, a difficult question to answer. Um, I toured the Florida Institute of Oceanography vessels the other day to try to reduce COVID spread there, which is really hard. But we ended up putting ultraviolet light in the air handlers to kill the virus. Uh, not perfect, but it clearly reduces the spread. Ideally, a room should have 12 air exchanges to 20 an hour. Most modern units don't have that capacity. Uh, to be fair, I have to read uh, all the questions uh, I get. And uh, this one is a little bit strange, but I'll read it. Uh, the, uh, the gentleman or the lady says, confront the fact that George Soros released the virus for Agenda 21. Uh, George Soros being a philanthropist who has okay. contributed uh, mightily to liberal causes. Who uh, Mr. Soros is. Um, I, no one released this virus. This virus has been shown by scientists to have evolved naturally. If you had attempted to engineer the virus, you would always leave fingerprints behind with certain 
segments of the RNA. Those segments are not present. It is not manipulated. Whoever thinks that um, would do well to spend a little time understanding the virology and the extent to which this idea has been disproven. Uh, please understand, I was not trying to tell you who George Soros is. I know you know George Soros. I was trying to uh, uh, tell the audience in case they do not know who he is. Obviously, you know. Uh, another question is coming. Do we know how many mutations of COVID-19 we have so far? The quick answer is no. But we right now, there's probably 19 variations, okay, of which two are important. And, you know, like Gertrude Stein says, for something to be important, it has to make a difference, okay? Mm -hmm. The A strain is originally from Wuhan. And to my mind, I think that's what's in California and Tampa. The B strain is mutated in Milan somewhere in Lombardy, and then went to New York and Miami. It replicates more quickly and is more lethal. So there are different strains. We can anticipate more mutations in the future. It would be wonderful if it mutated to become a virulent, but that is not likely to happen. Dr. Senate, could it be the fact that there are 17 or 19 mutation of this? Could this explain why some people uh, recover quick, more quickly than the others? Is oh, that because they might get the kind of uh, mutation that is not as deadly as others? Right. And it also depends as well on their genetic uh, response immunologically. The immune response is very much under genetic control. Uh, you respond too vigorously, you're going to get really sick. And I would tell you right now, you've had influenza, you felt terrible. It wasn't the virus making you feel bad. It was the cytokines. It was the immunoreactive parts of your body that make you feel bad, not the virus. It's the immune response. For instance, with COVID, you can't find the virus in a human after about eight days. But yet, we've had plenty of patients on the ventilator 25 days, and I have several patients that have never felt the same since. I have a question. Uh, what are the risks uh, to pregnant women? That's unclear. Initially, we thought there were no risks. But now we're seeing occasional, uncommon, but occasional instances of premature labor. There have been no birth defects associated with it, but premature labor seems to be associated with it. I have two questions about something that I know you feel very strongly about, and that is vitamin D and vitamin D efficiency. They're asking, A, how effective is it uh, with regulation of inflammation as well as dealing with the uh, COVID-19, uh, and how does it work? How does it help people who might have uh, the virus? Either question will get that person a Nobel Prize, okay? In 2017, the British Medical Journal published an article on the effects of low levels of vitamin D. It found if you normalized them, you reduced your risk of respiratory infections by 70%. And that's why I encourage everyone without renal stones 
kidney stones to take vitamin D, 4,000 units a day. Secondly, the way vitamin D modulates the immune system is perplexing. Everyone has tried to figure it out. No one can figure it out, but it does appear to be anti-inflammatory. Uh, it's almost eight o'clock, so I have one more question, Dr. Sennett, and then after that question, we're going to wrap it up. Uh, and let me see which one should I read. The question is about in case we develop the vaccine, who decides who gets it? Well, in a recent poll, that may not be that big a deal. And this poll I saw, which was on CNN, it said 40% of Americans did not want to take the vaccine. Now, if that's the case, um, I wish them luck. Um, the people that should get it should be based on, I feel, their risk of complications. The reason for that is the complicated patients totally tie up the healthcare system. A normal patient stays on the vent 3.4 days, a COVID patient 18 days. If I have to take care of a patient for 18 days, anything can go wrong. It's very difficult to do. It's extraordinarily labor intensive. So I think the at-risk people over 65, diabetic, obese, hypertensive, heart disease, lung disease, should get the vaccine first. And then I would just go down. Uh, I would then look after that vulnerable group. I would look at essential workers. And of all things, I would give the food care workers vaccine because we can't have the food chain disrupted. We can't have these massive outbreaks in meat processing facilities. You know, pretty soon people are gonna say, wait a second, I don't care if I'm a central worker or not, I'm not going to make any more Jimmy Dean pork sausage. Um, so I think food care workers, obviously healthcare workers, if you want them to take care of you, and then law enforcement, so that we have someone there to protect the, our society. Uh, Dr. Janet, let me see if I can summarize some of the most important points you made in the past two conversations I've had with you. Number one, and correct me if I'm wrong, number one, take this virus very seriously. Number two, wear your mask. Uh, number three, uh, practice social distancing. And perhaps the most important uh, conclusion I've drawn from your observation, do not expect to go back to your normal life anytime soon. Am I correct in those four conclusions? You are exactly correct. You left out washing your hands thoroughly. But um, as I might have done before, I compare it to 9-11. There was a time before 9-11 and a time after 9-11 and they're not the same. As somebody said, it doesn't matter whether you're a Republican or a Democrat, left or right, fascist or a communist, it doesn't matter. When it comes to the virus, it doesn't discriminate. That's and for sure. I think with that, I, once again, I want to thank you for your time, for your insight, for your fantastic analysis. And I want to thank you for being a great supporter of our center as well. Dr. Johnson, have a wonderful evening and thank you. And ladies and gentlemen, with that, have a wonderful day. Please practice social distancing, wear your mask, wash your hands, your face, and may God bless all of you. Thank you. Good night. It was my honor. Thank you, Mosin.